dollar limit. Let's discuss that. We're not voting on anything today. We're just totally discussing. I, I would like to have that on the agenda for the 22nd, and uh, uh, Bruce has worked this up uh, with the wording of it and so forth, I believe. But uh, it previously was 10000 when I've been on the board for a long time, it was $10,000 that the district manager could spend without board approval. And then uh, I think while I was off for some time, it went to $35,000. And I think that uh, in the last few years, uh, there's some things, I don't think it was purposeful, but the board was not aware of some of the purchases that were made. And you have three of those and you get $100,000. And uh, we're right now facing a, a budget concern, a crisis, if you will. So I'd like to be involved in uh, anything uh, that uh, is around ten or 15000 uh, And uh, I think our new district manager will uh, work with us on that and uh, keep us up to date. If we have to have a special meeting, I don't mind doing that. And I think uh, the public needs to know also. Uh, now, on the fire department, we were spending that kind of money, but we were voting on all of those things, especially the big fire trucks and so forth. But this is for day-to-day -day, uh, purchases uh, that I think needs to be, uh, we need to be notified about it and vote on it. I would like to make a comment, please. Um, did any of you look at the list of checks that Carrie sent us? Okay. Yeah. And I went through the minutes from all of the previous meetings. And um, the only two that stuck out was where we paid 65 or 35 each for two fire trucks. But those items were approved at the board meeting on May the 27th <coughs> at the regular meeting. And running through other things, the garage door ninja and Island Air Co. and A-plus roofing were the only things that stuck out to me as not being on the regular, part of the regular budget. With their, to, in my way of thinking, I, I think two things. There has been no abuse of the $35,000 limit. The other thing is that with the inflationary cost Prices of everything has gone up. And as I said at the last meeting, I wouldn't be opposed to reducing it somewhat, but 10000 to me is way too low. <clears throat> the other point I'd like to make is that every time we have a special meeting, Island Derrico gets a call that they need to spend $20,000 $20, on uh, something and is an emergency then you have to call the abuse commissioner, see if they're available. You have to run a special agenda. You have to post it two hours in advance. And it just seems like uh, the limit is too low to create that much work. Well, uh, both, I, I appreciate what you just said, but uh, concerning the uh, HVAC air conditioning, uh, there's my own personal experience, and also I think Bruce can add to this, that there are uh, other companies, and uh, Island Airco has been bought out by a company that has 50 umbrella companies. They own Rogers, Bentonville, all over the place. So it's no longer like a home uh, company. But we have to get the lowest price possible, and uh, all of the air conditioners and heat pumps are made by about five companies. They've got about 15 brands on them. Uh, Lennox and the American Standard and so forth, but we need to get the lowest price possible and we need to go to other vendors and uh, there's one out here by the Elks Lodge that's not in Holiday Island, but it's uh, very competitive and uh, we save $500 just at the barn, the Friends of the Barn money. We don't have a whole lot, but we need to be more uh, careful about going out for bids and just because they say it's an emergency and we've got to replace someone outside here, uh, there are other uh, more inexpensive ways to do it. Well, uh, Ken, I was not referring to Island Air Codenesis. That was the name that's on the sheet. This isn't competition among vendors. This is setting a limit for when something emergency comes up. This building was without power during the coldest part of the year. And uh, 
to, to think that we would have to have a meeting before an air conditioning and HVAC company could come out and get the power back on here, it just doesn't make sense to me. I'd like to make a comment. You know, you can do whatever you want with this 35000 but if I had a $10,000 limit, and I took that $10,000 and I spent 5000 on this, 5000 on this, I'm I'm way below that 10,000 anytime. Same way with the 35. Exactly. I think if you are a commissioner and you don't want to come to a meeting, ma'am, don't be a commissioner. I said nothing about coming to the meeting. Okay. There, there, you just okay. said you just said and stated that you did not want to have all these meetings. You said that. I am tired of that. Okay. Let's move along here. Um, I, I, I think a ten to fifteen thousand dollar limit, uh, without board approval, would be in order. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I think it would 15. definitely be. Uh, I, I can live with fifteen is fine without yeah. board approval. Ten. He said fifteen. I said ten would be my qu quote. We can do <laughs> we can do fifteen with a meeting. What do you think, Randy? Well, I think. Thus far, what Bruce has said that the most we're spending on these air conditioners is about twelve grand. So twelve to fifteen, somewhere around there. So he can at least fix an air. But I don't see an air conditioner as an emergency. No. And power and air conditioning are two separate things. Right. If the power's out, I hope they call Carol Electric and not Island Airco. No. I'd be willing to go to fifteen, Mr. Chairman. I well, if, that, if that's what it'll take to cover one of these split units, and in the case of not cooling enough, it doesn't provide the heat, right? Well, I believe it, it does was, provide yeah. the heat. But, but let, me, let me just clarify. The uh, regulation that I drafted would give you a notification if it's over 10. But if it was over 15, then it would require a meeting and approval. I, I think that's fair. I would go along with that. Now, the, the, so that will be on our agenda as a regulation modification at our, our next meeting. And I guess the question is, you know, you have to think about, I don't know that this is an emergency that has to be meted right away, but, you know, ordinarily it's uh, first reading, second reading, unless you want to, uh, but that's something you can think about. Uh, it, emergency. Uh, Passage because the new district manager comes in on the uh, 15th, I think, and if we're meeting on the 22nd, this will give him a clear uh, direction from then on, and he'll know what to do as far as uh, purchasing. Sounds fine to me. Okay. I agree with that. Okay, the next item is foreclosed lot uh, Yeah, as, as you are aware, we uh, foreclosed on 270 lots a few weeks ago, and we put those on our um, on our newsletter. Those are available for $1,000 each. We've sold one of those. We have another well, probably 100 lots that were foreclosed last year that are $500 a piece. We basically have a one, one, buyer, one buyer of each category. So there wasn't any gangbusters activity on that. Um, one of the things you probably need to be aware of is for closing on those 270 lots is going to amount to a, a really large write-off this year, about 500,000, and we have an allowance in our accounting system of about 400,000. So that's another thing that's going to hit your earnings for the year pretty severely. That's if we foreclose. We did foreclose those, okay. those 270. Okay. 270. Just don't foreclose on those. Just it's a history. The tax sale. It's a done deal. Yeah, it's already done. Yeah. I know, but from, from now on, why don't we do that? Yeah. That's something to consider, yeah. So we, we sold two lots. Yeah. <laughs> sure. What is the, uh, the end result, Bruce, as far as uh, our financial picture? Long term, if we uh, continue to do what you just mentioned or changed it, uh, 
how could we make our financial picture better uh, with these laws? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll see that first of all. We're still working on that. Is it, the light hadn't come on yet in your crystal ball. Yeah. <clears throat> we we can let Eureka and X them. It, no, I, I, I'm serious about it. I don't mean to be jovial about it. But yeah. yeah. Well, really, really, the the my strong recommendation is to, as, as Doug suggested, <coughs> cease foreclosing on vacant lots. Okay, the next item on here is rec center labor costs and hours should be closed in the winter. Question mark. That's it. Should it be closed in the winter? Okay, what are, what is the labor cost and the hours? One one thing we just spent a ton of money building a new sports center and it's not being utilized. We need a full time activity director that starts using the facilities that we have there. Pickleball tournaments, uh, miniature golf tournaments for the kids, uh, more pool activities. Uh, it needs to be used. It's sitting there and it's not being utilized. And it hasn't been in the past three years that I have been back here. Uh, it, it needs, we need, it needs some work. Mr. Chairman, we spent $110,963 last year in labor for the rec center. We took in $22,226 in golf, or I'm sorry, in swimming. We took in $22,969 in golf fees. So we collected roughly a $50,000, and we spent $110,000 to do that. I'm having trouble with the business sense of that. Well, if I owned that business and I had, it took me 110,000 to make 50, I think I'd bail on the deal. I think I would too. That's why it needs to have activity. The more activity you've got up there, the, the more money you're going to bring in. And we shoot ourselves in the foot every time we turn around. We, we're charging $300 for people to, uh, to not send their people up here. They're property owners. They should pay the same as any other property owner. But then the people that come there, they pay for the usage of it. Uh, these bed and breakfasts, uh, they, they want the facilities, and we're penalizing them, charging them $300, and, and they're a property owner. How many of those did we collect last year? I, that, I don't know. I, I don't think they were of used. Of the twenty-two thousand dollars we collected, how many were of those of that money? How many were three hundred dollar payments from short-term rentals? I think Janice can answer that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not on. When the light comes on. There. there you go. Okay. <clears throat> Last year, I believe I, there was like seven or eight of the short-term rentals. <clears throat> and the reason that is because you had a lot of these management companies or people who owned these houses and didn't want to do it. Now, I did turn away several people that came as guests of that Airbnb VRBO. They went back, and they would turn around and put a bad review in. Now, I've already had three people come to me so far this year, two of them. One has two rentals and one has a third one. And I asked them to wait a little bit until we had this meeting to see what was going to go on. Um, do they generate money? Not unless they buy the pass. Now, talking about this because they are, and I'm going to bring this up now because I want you to be aware of this. We are a class B pool. Okay, class B pool says we're private and property owners and their guests would come in with a property owner. When we have all these VRBOs coming in and the property owner is not with them, we become a general public pool. As a general public pool, when you have more of those guests in there versus the property owners, we need a lifeguard. We do not have lifeguards. Now, I'm not saying that somebody's going to check on this for us 
you know, the state's going to come out. But if something happens and the general public is in there more than the property owners, we have that fine line of did we need a lifeguard or not. Even though there's signs that say swim at your own risk, no lifeguard on duty, insurance companies don't go by those signs. I'm, that's just how it is. Um, activity director, we have a pickleball court and we've just had it, the guys just re, we did all the cracks and stuff. Now they're going to have to paint it. Yes, people come and play pickleball. If you have a tournament, you need at least three or four courts to do a tournament. We have painted lines in the tennis court for another pickleball court, but people don't like to play there because they like this one. Um, mini golf, we have a nice little mini golf thing down there. Kids come and play. We put all sorts of little animals out there on the signs and we give, tell the kids to go out and count the animals. They come back and I have a little bag of goodies for them and they're really happy. You're not gonna get a mini golf tournament out of that place. I have tried activities. I had a putting on the nine. The first week, everybody showed up. I had 30 people. It cost them $3 for a donation. They got a cart, they went out. I went on a golf course and put all sorts of stuff out there to keep them from putting, like a toilet seat around the hole and little toys they had to do. It was a lot of fun. The second week, I maybe had 15. The third week, nobody showed up. It was done. So activity-wise, we have a blow-up volleyball net for the pool. Now, you have to put that in the small area. So we could put it, set aside a day, say Tuesday morning, It'll be, up, or it'll be up in the afternoon to come and play volleyball. That's something we can do. We put it up when we had pool parties. You know, yes, for the last three years, we haven't done much because we were stuck with COVID, and COVID kept us from doing a lot of stuff. Then we had to move out of there because we were going to build a building, so now we didn't have a place to hold a party or anything else. Yes, it's been pretty dead there for the last couple of years because of the fact that the building was gone and COVID hit. So yes, I'm excited about this new building. I'm excited that we can start doing things, have pool parties for the adults. And kids will come, you know, we have a lot of people moving away and a lot of people that came to that pool are not coming again this year because they have moved away or unfortunately they've passed away. So it's a whole new generation coming into this pool area. I can tell you that now, it's not the same uh, dynamics. We have people retiring earlier. They work from home. They may have small children. It's different, it's totally different. And it's a new thing that you have to look at. And what kind of activities they want to hike. They want a dog park. They want uh, fun on the golf course. You know, just little things you can do on the golf course, not an actual playing of golf. I'm just, you know, you can, Find an erect director that might have something that, you know, could fit the people. Yes. Janice, uh, let me ask about labor costs. Uh, the new building will open hopefully soon. Uh, if you're there, how many clerks need to be there and how many clerks do you have? At There's the one, person on a, one person on a shift. I go in there probably five hours a day. I try to do it in between the two shifts so that when questions come up, that they don't want to answer, or they don't feel comfortable answering, I'll be there. So I'm there some like from 10 in the morning to maybe three in the afternoon. The first shift then is from nine to, I gotta figure it out, depending on what the hours are gonna be. And then there's one person later. So there's always gonna be one person at some point where they're by themselves. It's not easy to do though. I mean, it's, and now we've got two pools that we have to watch. Okay, well that's the question I have with this new building and I heard a lot about the windows, looking mm -hmm. out at small and uh, big pool and mm -hmm. so forth. How much of their time would you estimate is going to be spent looking at safety, uh, somebody calling for help or drowning, if you will? I'm being serious about yeah, it. Yeah, I know. Uh, the whole time, we always look at the pools. We don't not look at the pools. We're always watching, you know, even before, my office was way in the back before, I'd come out there and sit out there in the front, look at this pool, look at the little pool. We had access to see the little pool from the other building. The big pool was a little bit odd for us because it was set over differently. So, so your instructions to the clerks when the new building opens is watch both sides. Oh, yeah. If you're not checking somebody in, be watchful. Is that right? That's right. We always do that. We don't sit there and do nothing. Why are we not having a lifeguard and 
get rid of uh, that person there that's watching that. Wouldn't that make a lot more sense, having somebody out there where they actually could save somebody's life if they were drowned? Sure, but who's going to check in the golfers? And who's going to check well, in the You're going to have to have somebody in there, but you, well, rather than to have a lifeguard, I think, you know, when we ran our pool in, in town, we had to have a lifeguard uh, on duty all the time, mm -hmm. any time that it was open. You know, you can do what you want, even a private pool, I'm telling you, if you don't, you, you tell people, well, you're at your own risk, you wait till somebody drowns. Sure. You'll find out how much risk you're yeah, at. Yeah, I know. Because you will be sued till Absolutely. hell won't have it. Absolutely. So what you got to do is, well, I think we need <clears throat> to have a lifeguard when we have two pools. I think that's, that's a priority that's got to be done. And when we've had lifeguards before, they were... Teenagers, okay. That That's went, all you need. That's all we ever had. Okay, they went and got certified, the court, right? And if you could get them to sit outside the pool and watch people, you'd be really lucky. They were in the pool swimming with their friends. They were inside talking to us. They never sat out at the pool. I'm serious. I'm serious. You could tell. Well, I them understand that, but you can give if whoever's the manager of that place can instruct that person. You do this again. You won't be here tomorrow. Yes. That's what you got to do. Yes. If, you know, I ran a business for 50 years, and I never saw business ran like, like, mm. like what we did here on financial. Mm. I've never seen it happen. Uh, I'd, I'd be closed up in next week. And so I know that if we're going to have a lifeguard, we need one sitting there watching people, just like the gal looking out the window. That, if that person, somebody's drowning out there, she won't even see them. When it gets crowded, when there is more than 25 people in the big pool, I will go out there and sit there. I will. And when there's a, a family... Yeah, but you're only there a few, a few hours a day. No, I mean, I'm there five hours a day. So when I'm there, when there's a family reunion or something that comes from the barn and they are allowed to use the pool for a fee, all their outside family and friends, oh, I'll sit there. I'll sit there and yell at the kids with my whistle and everything you, can else. You, do you have, are you a lifeguard? No, I'm not a lifeguard. Okay, then we don't need you sitting there. That's fine. <laughs> okay. All right, let's move along. Uh, yes, of course. I don't know if you need a name and address. Barb Coon, 62 Holiday Island Drive. One thing I want the board to remember... The amenities at Holiday Island are paid for with assessments. It is not a business. It is not a profit center. We have to pay whatever we have to pay to keep these amenities open. And if that causes a raise in assessments, that's life. Now, we can do whatever we can to bring money in there. I'm not opposed to that at all. I pay $900 to pay go play golf maybe 15 times a year because I want the amenity open. I pay the pool fee because I want the pool fee open. I swim twice a year. Not every homeowner is going to do that here. I'm just one of those. I've been here 20 years. I want Holiday Island to prosper. I want our amenities to keep going, so I pay the fees. If you can find other ways to raise money what for these amenities, Hallelujah, but Holiday Island has amenities for a reason, and our assessments pay those. Yes, ma'am. Look, right. Barbara, I think we have a responsibility as the board to look at the labor costs. Absolutely. And we can't increase the revenue, but the next best thing is to reduce our costs. Well, how do you and reduce one person? How do you reduce one person who's checking people in? What are you going to do? If you now you, you now you're well, put it this way: one person at the 18 hole can check in 40 old coots golfers in about an hour. Well, they don't only do checking in. Up no, they take 18. food orders as well. Yeah. One person. Yeah. Well, somebody has to cook it. Somebody has to clean the place. Somebody has to, you know. You're not. I I agree. You know, if you think you got too many people working at the 18 hole, you don't at the nine hole, but. You know, save where you can. I, I don't disagree with that at all. I agree that you should make money where you can, save money where you can, but you can't get rid of everybody. Thanks, Barbara. Yep. You can make them more profitable, though. Okay. Well, what? All right, let's, let's get. 
we, we discussed that. We, we're going to have to have a, 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 probably another work session in order to go over all these fees and stuff. But I don't think we're going to get around to all of it today. But anyway, let's, let's go ahead and get this food and beverage rules for the golf course. Uh, get, let's get that one out of the way. Have, well, I've been working on these land projects for damn near 40 years. And every single one of them I've ever worked on, you did not bring your own beverages. You, bought, you purchased them from the, from the, the, the establishment. Uh, you did not bring your own food. I know that at this point in time, it's probably going to cause some, some problems with people on the 18-hole course particularly, uh, saying, or maybe even the 9-hole course. Of course, I don't think beer is available down there or anything like that. But, uh, but at the 18-hole course, uh, I think that we should make arrangements for uh, cooler rent. Uh, you can, we'll loan you a cooler. Outside? Uh, but anyway, they have uh, coolers for use there now. Yeah, it's a, okay. Yeah, and buy, buy the beer from there, and yeah, I think it's going to be real, real tough for you to. We're going to you to have somebody monitor that, because I could stop by my house uh, when I'm when I'm on number nine, run over there, grab a beer, and drink it. And you can, and I'm telling you, how would you in ever ever find out that I didn't buy that beer from somebody? Well, your, that, your wife called us and told us. Yeah. Well, I'm saying, but that can happen. And we got houses all over, so it's not going to happen. I don't care what you. But you know, if you if you take away, like uh, the other day we announced, uh, uh, Billy announced after after the meeting, and I'm going to go right over this. He announced uh, after our golf thing, he stood up and said, "Guys, we can't have our a normal. We do it twice a year. We." Bring in everybody brings a potluck and they set on the we have a tournament and then after the tournament they everybody brings a, a dish and, and you eat it right on the patio out there and that's fine but he said the commissioners decided that that's not going to now I've been a commissioner here and I've only been since December I've talked to uh, I've talked to Ken and he doesn't recall the commissioners in the, all that time ever saying and ever putting up that sign why now is all of a sudden we can't have 50 guys come to come there, you know. So they, they said, "Well, we'll just have it somewhere else." Well, does that make sense? But it sure made me look like a bad guy when he stands up and says, "The commissioner said." Everybody looks at me and said, "Why did you do this?" I said, "I didn't do this," and I stood up and told him that I, since I've been here, there's never been. And, I, and I, I think Ken told me in the t seven years he's been here, he's never, ever heard a vote that the way they did any of that. So I, I know I've been in there. I've been in there in the afternoon towards evening, walked in there, and people come for supper, or when they, when they did come for supper in there, and they brought bottles of wine in there, their own bottles of wine. They allowed it right there. They brought it inside the building. I've never seen anybody from outside carry a beer inside and drink it in there. Never. Now, all of a sudden, it's, if we're going to change the rules, let's make it fair for everybody, not just, and, you know, I think you're, I think you're, you're not going to be able to, some guy could stop by his house and get a beer and put it in his cooler, and I'm telling you, you're never going to know. Well, I can assure you that uh, in every place I've ever been, me too. There's bootlegging going on. Yep. Uh, when I lived at 32 Holiday Island Drive, I'm number 12, uh, I lived there for 15 years. Uh, they would go by my house and come into the garage and help themselves. <laughs> well, I'm sure that, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, so if you, if you start making all these rules and regulations, they'll just go, they'll, people go somewhere else. Yeah. And I, I think for the outside people that come in, you're ne they're always going to buy their beer inside. But you know one thing? If they're not open, how do you buy any beer? That's, that's, that, you gotta, how do you buy food? When if I ordered food at 4 o'clock for supper, I wouldn't order food for, 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 because I don't eat till 8. So, I mean, this makes no sense to me how we're operating that place, period. I think it's poorly operated, 
And I'll, I'll say that up front. And I think it needs, we need to change how we operate things. We had to operate that thing like a business. Hopefully, I, I don't think we've gotten anybody so far that I've heard of that's uh, biting a bit. To we need to go out and try to get some people. We that's do. what we need. Yeah, not, we do. Not just, not just advertise. We need to go talk to this lady in the, 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 this food truck. We've already talked to uh, Bruce. Is, uh, Bryce is interested. Uh, you know, uh, I think maybe, we, you know, we've got to decide what we're going to what we gonna, how are we gonna update, what do we need to update in there to make it, but I do think we need to have somebody for those weddings, because I think we can rent that out every weekend. But I know the guy that runs a place told me he doesn't want those every weekend. Well, I talked to uh, Lauren uh, last week, and he told me that two cooks had resigned. Two cooks are gone. They only have uh, one or two left. Uh, one of the ladies can just be a starter at the clerk, because she can't stand in the kitchen that long. So we've got a problem with staffing, and it's just like the uh, lifeguards. We can't hire them. They're over in Eureka. They, Rogers can't hire them. Bentonville can't hire them. Uh, there's just people not available to come all the way here. Uh, but that's another question. But uh, I was in Austin a week ago and went on the course with my son, and it was $89 to play. Uh, they had a cart that goes around. A beer was like $6.50. So what happens on the courses is you're forced to bring your own pop or beer in your cooler, in your bag or whatever. And uh, like uh, uh, Larry said, it's that way all around the country. But uh, if we've got a country club and we have a 19th hole, we should be making money. We should have a bar there and so forth, but we don't. So we're going to have to either decide, are we going to have just a golf course, two golf courses, an 18 and a 9? The 9 hole doesn't even sell beer. So how can you not bring your beer on your cart there? I don't know. But we've got a problem. We've got a morale problem up there at the 18. And uh, I don't know what we're going to do about it. But uh, then we got the consultant says move downstairs with the starter. Uh, I don't agree with that. Um, you know, we're going to have to spend thousands of dollars to remodel and do everything. Then we've got all the groups that meet down there. Where are they going to go? We have the Holiday Island Singers meeting at our church because they had uh, difficulty with the Thursday afternoon. Uh, so we give it to them free. You know, they, they were meeting at our building, our building, but now they're, uh, they're meeting at a church instead of our building. So we've got to look into it, and it's not a snap fix. It's not an easy fix. But we've got some morale problems, and we've got some financial problems that Randy brought up. That was over at the 9-hole. We probably have the same things going on at the 18-hole. By going on, I mean... Uh, and, and Barb, I appreciate your comment. These are amenities, and they probably weren't made to make money, but we can't afford maybe to lose as much as we are. That's what I said. Okay. Let's get into it. You're going to update us on the transition, uh, uh, Rich? Uh, yeah. I, I, well, I don't have a whole lot to say, although I, I prepared an outline that I'm going to go over with Rich to kind of bring him up to speed on the issues that are pending and uh, where our regulations are and where the state code is and all of that kind of stuff. I'm going to consider my contract terminated at the end of this week. And what I'm going to suggest is that uh, when Rich uh, wants uh, a little coaching, I'll come in for a couple hours uh, whenever he needs it. I think that would be great. I, I, I think it would be a heck of assistance to him because he's going to need some help for a while. Probably, you know, probably a couple of days a week. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean... I, you know, I mean, a couple, three hours, uh, twice a week, maybe. Yeah, well, when I'm retired from this position, I yeah. will have time. Yeah, well, as, whenever, as whenever it works for you. I mean, when he needs help, he, I think I'd, I'd approve him calling you and say, hey, could you uh, meet me for an hour? Yeah. What, what do you guys think? But uh, I agree, uh, Bruce. We've got a lot of big things, and uh, SIDS are very different. Uh, I didn't know about a SID before I moved here 18 years ago, but coming in and running one, uh, Larry, you know, because you've started them all over the country, but uh, they're very complex. They're different. They're not a city. They're not a county office. They're just different. And uh, when Rick went up there with you, Bruce, to the uh, whole, uh, or I mean, sorry, well, five, it's a big deal what he found and what you uh, talked to him about. 
uh, that the cost of doing that thing are way, way lower than what we were led to believe. Way lower. Not a million dollars. Not a million dollars. You can quote me on that. But he needs some uh, background. Then we've got the UV system, 750000 I heard that may be a million. We've got to get these things under control. And Larry and I were mentioning earlier, infrastructure. That's the biggest thing we've got to work on in this SIT. And uh, I hope that he can uh, come in and help us on that. And Bruce, you've got a lot of experience and uh, knowledge about the water system. And I think you'll need a little transition time. Bruce, when does Rich start actually start to work? Uh, the 15th. Actually, he'll be here on the 11th, and he was going to come up and, you know, visit a little bit on the 12th before he even starts his officially starts. So Friday this week, he'll he'll be in the office here. Okay. But well, he's going to be I, here. I just think he's going to need some mentoring from you, at least for the first week. Probably more than a week. I mean, there's. Well, I mean, that's just to make are... all the introductions and find out where everything is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I'm going to suggest to him is the first week. Well, I'm going to sit down with him with some of the issues, and then I'm going to suggest that he call each of the department heads and arrange a time to meet with them personally, individually, have a tour of what they've got going on, and talk about what they have on the agenda. Yeah, get acquainted. And, and then he and I, I've got a whole list of issues and a little bit of, and when he wants to tackle one, I'll come in and coach him on it. And when he tackles the next one, come in and coach him on it. Okay. We have covered about all of that kind of stuff that's on the agenda. We need to get down to the fees. And I, I would really like for Lauren to be here to go over the golf fees. Well, the golf fees are being collected already. There's probably not much we can do okay. to adjust those okay. this year. Uh, They're actually, they should have been paid by April 1st. Yeah. That's yeah. true, but we could still, and I'm still yeah. an advocate of having punch cards. Yep. Which could be instituted at any time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I've gotten nothing but feed, negative feedback since we did away with them. The daily golf on the 18 hole is 25 bucks. If you play on the nine hole, it's 20 bucks. Five dollars difference and you get half as much golf. There's a lot of people that play the Thursday night league. It's a par three, co-ed, anybody can play golf kind of thing. Those people want a punch card. They don't want to buy an annual membership and they don't want to pay $35 a week to come out and have fun with their friends. All of them had suggested why we do not go back to the punch cards. A lot of men have told me their wives would like to play three or four times a year. They would buy a punch card, but they won't buy an annual membership and they don't want to pay a daily fee. I, I talked with Lauren about reinstating the punch card system and, and he agreed. Uh, he's, he thought it would be good to to go ahead and do that. I well, think what we I'd be curious, there. and I can't find it in the financials, is in the last year we did the punch cards, there was revenue generated. Then we did away with it. I want to know what the difference is. Uh, and I, right now, I would suggest that we do a punch card, a 10 punch punch card for 110 bucks. Or 120 bucks. That'd make it $12 per round on the nine hole. If you take it to the 18 hole, same as they did before, if you went to the 18 hole, they punched it twice. So you'd be paying $24 instead of 25. I think that's a good idea. And on the nine hole, instead of paying 20, you would pay 12. I think that's an excellent idea. And I don't think, I think the volume would make up for the discount. I think you're right too. We got a lot of people sit home because they don't want to go play golf because they can't get a punch card. As dumb as that sounds, that's the feedback I'm getting. I, I have gotten the same feedback. So I and suggest I that we reinstitute the punch cards. Yeah, I, I do too. Uh, Bruce, I know you had a concern about uh, the financial picture and uh, having uh, less income uh, rather than more or the same. 
And uh, you and I talked about in terms of if you're getting $25, and that's what the consultant raised it to, or we, we raised it to it after the consultant left, that was a 20% increase, $900 for a year for one single player. Uh, if we go to this, uh, Randy's right, I don't know if we keep good records, but I had uh, four <coughs> punch cards last year, $400, 100 100 100, 100. And, uh, But it, now it's 25 Somebody mentioned, well, why don't you have 10 for 250 well, the only thing that does for you is that you don't have to go in and put your credit card out. You just punch the ticket. So it doesn't save you any money. But then we've got the other uh, problem of what of our $800,000 if we're in arrears on a budget. So I'm sort of mixed, but uh, I agree with what Randy said, the different reasons for them. But um, we've had concerns ever since I've been here about uh, the golf course cost. I think the most accurate was $300,000 $300, out of your uh, assessments and mine to keep the golf courses going. And we've had less uh, people working on them than we did before. But $300,000, we've sort of dropped that. We're not worried about it anymore. I'm not uh, to keep these courses going. But in terms of the play on the golf course, um, we get a lot of out-of-district out of play. And uh, I made that motion several years ago. and. Uh, the developer probably put out a contract on me because they didn't like that out of district play. Talk to Lauren about how many people are out of district play all the week long. It's a bunch, okay? And that's bringing in big money or bigger money. So I'm ambivalent about it, but I, I can see the reasons for both things about it. Well, well I'd also like to add that uh, punch cards are only for Holiday Island residents. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. It's not for outsiders no. to come in and buy a punch card. Well, the it. other thing, uh, there's a lot of complaints about, uh, I know it, the revenue is not that great, but the revenue on the nine-hole course should not be allocated to the rec center. It should be allocated to the golf course. That income should be folded into the golf course because we get criticized. You're not, you're not making any money on the golf course. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And we're paying all this money out. Well... If it's twenty-five or thirty-five or forty-five thousand dollars that you got income on the nine-hole course, that needs to go to the golf course, not the rec center. That's not rec center business. The chemicals and stuff that are paid for on the golf course come out of the golf course budget, and the money, that, any revenue, should be going back to there. Uh, you I mean it hasn't, Larry? No. You don't have two entities. I why? Why would you not? I mean, that's just good business. I think it's accounted as golf income at the rec center. At the rec yeah, center. It, it yeah. just breaks it out by where it's played. But it's not split off, so you can no. look yeah. at it? It should be. It, yeah, it's well, it's split off where you can look at it. Yeah, it's here. But that money should be allocated to golf it operations. It go back to the golf dollars course for dollars. use of the golf yes. course only. Yes. Right. <laughs> it's generated the money. Yes. Yeah. We can ask Jennifer uh, how to do that. Well, yeah, it's we broken can. out now. It is. Well, it's broken out. Well, it is printed, but I mean, it's it's printed, but but it needs to go back to the golf no, course, no, it, basically. It, what it does is it does not show that it's going back to the golf course. It 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 needs to be allocated to golf because that's where all the expenses are. Uh, so it needs to come out of there. Another thing on the family passes, uh, uh, family passes should include all the kids, and, and if, the, if the, I think, if the family person is with them, any of the grandkids, they, they come in at no charge. Now, as far as the uh, rental property, if the people that own the rental property take out the permit, it should be the same as any property owner. Their guests, whenever they come in, should pay the five dollar fee. Uh, and that should happen, but we, we don't need to gouge them for three hundred dollars. They are they are property owners just like the rest of us, and they should pay the same amount. Well, uh, they but they won't be with their guests. They won't be with their guests. That's right. why their guests are paying five bucks. Right, but the rules state that a guest has to property owner. You have to be with the guest has to be with the property owner to get in the pool because it's private. 
So that's where we run into that problem. All these people come in. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling we, you what I read. You yourself in the foot by not promoting what we got. We, we have that, these people Sir, come I down understand. here and rent these places. And I went to a AHA meeting a month or two ago, and they sat around in a semicircle and they talked about why they came here and why they settled here. I was there. I think you were there. I was there. I was yes, there. sir. Uh, and you were there. Mm -hmm. And I heard time after time after time that we came down here and we stayed out here at Holiday Island and went to Branson and went to Eureka Springs and mm -hmm. met with their kids and all that kind of stuff. And after about the third time, I, had, I heard a lot of people say, we could live here. Mm -hmm. That's what we wanted to do. We've got to make it where people want to live here. And then... And I understand that. And I Can't can, we change I, the rules? Sure we can. Why, don't, why not change the rules? I don't, I don't see any reason why we don't. Okay. Which rule to what? Which, which rule are you talking pro, about? This, that a property owner has to, if he has a guest, has to be with him. Mm -hmm. Can't we change that rule? I mean, can't that property owner give that guy a slip, uh, a, something that he has, and the guy goes down there and says, I'm, I'm the guest, and here it is, and, and, uh, pay, and, and pay the fee. This is, this is where, where they run into the problem with the pool then. I mean, we, had to, we have to turn away people that come from Eureka Springs, okay? Because I had this happen two years ago. Some girl called and says, well, I see you on your website, you know, guest cost this. And I said, are you staying in Holiday Island? Oh, no, we're in, we're in Eureka Springs, we're, you know, at a hotel. I said, I'm sorry, it's only for property owners. Well, that's not what it says. So you have to change their pro property owner guest. You, uh, you open up a whole can of worms with this. I mean, if you're going to change it from private to open to the public, it's a whole different ball game. I understand that. And, and if you want to do that, then you have to uh, look for paying $25 for a lifeguard if you can even find one. Here, let me say this. Uh, Don Howes, the head of the Planning Commission, spoke to our mm -hmm. church uh, breakfast last Monday, and he, we had a real good crowd there. He said that the uh, Airbnb and the VRBO nightly rentals, they must live within 50 miles of uh, Holiday Island because if the power goes out, the plumbing goes out, they have to be here immediately to uh, uh, take care of the situation. So if they're living in uh, Tonti Town or something mm -hmm. or Berryville, uh, how can they be with the guests who are renting their home? How can they come and say, I'm John Doe from Berryville, I own a home on Holiday Island Drive, but I can't be there because I'm in Berryville. Right. How can they be with the swimmer? They can't. Well, so that's, that's that, what a rule says. That, a rule says that. that property owner's guest. They are that guest. They're yeah. living in their house. They're that guest. Yeah. So but you're, not, you're, not, you're not selling it to I mean, somebody to live. No, just, and a minute, I, just a minute. Just a minute. I'll be through in just a minute. Uh, we're, we're, not, we're not advertising it for people at the end of the Ozarks. We're advertising it, we should be advertising it for the people that are out here at, as guests at, of these people that own the Airbnbs or Go Bros or whatever they're called, bed, bed and breakfast. But they are their guest, uh, but they have to be a guest of that property owner. And then they can go in. That, then it's not public. It's private. It's still private because they are guests of the property owner. Then we'll have to change the wording on that because it says the property in the black book, the little black book that we all use. It says get, well, guests need, must be accompanied need, we, by the property owner. We need, we need to redo. Then the, the black regulation book. would have to be changed. Change the rule. It's right. simple. We, we'll, we'll look at the black book. Uh, well, just just one other view of it is that. The, uh, the nightly rentals, they get a lot of income on an annual year and offering their guests, their, their guests pool privileges should be a valuable asset to them. I agree. Should right. be worth the yes, 300, right. I would it, think. It should be. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Yes. I think that- It's a business for them, yes. Yes, it, and they're profiting off us. They're sending people in and, mm -hmm. and we're- Well, we're charging those people coming in five bucks. That's, that's fine. That's still really that's, cheap. I think that's perfectly appropriate. But I, wants I, I, I don't think it's but I, I think, property owner. I think a property owner who is making money off of his piece of property, so it's, it's, a, it's a business, and one of his expenses of doing business mm -hmm. 
should be three hundred dollars for a pool pass. It's just <coughs> cut and dry. How many? You said you had seven or eight Last of those. Last year was about seven or eight, maybe close to nine. Yeah. Seven or eight. Yeah. Oh, well, there have been a lot. Just just about everybody who's selling their houses now, the people buying them are turning them into Airbnb, VRBO. Yeah. It's, so it's, that that number could go up growing. dramatically and, it's and helps our bottom line. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing. Not three hundred dollars. Seven or eight. What is the reaction when you say three hundred dollars? Do they pay it or are they a grunt? They pay it. I even have people that live one gal lives in Pennsylvania. She calls me every year we started doing this and gives me her credit card information. She does it automatically. Whether or not somebody comes from her place, but they do come from her place. And they come and enjoy the pool. But it's, you know, it's, it's a no-brainer for the ones that are, really want this to go for themselves. They do it. Yeah, I, I, I don't see any business. reason not to charge a, a business owner. Right. We started at 600, remember? Yeah, yeah. And then that was like nobody did it. So we dropped it to three, and then we had these other ones doing yeah. it. And they always they call and ask me, you know, they're, yeah. they're doing it. They're all in business to make money, too, right. and they can okay. add that $300 into their nightly fees. It they, seems like that business is booming at Holiday yes, Island. Yes, it is. It's going nuts. So it I, is. I would guess we'll have a whole yeah. lot more. Than it is. But oh. uh, I, I, I feel we ought to keep that... Uh, okay. Permit for the short-term rentals for the overnight. Okay, rentals. but we'll we will we will try to get that put together and so that we can vote on it. Mr. Chairman, I, I know there's a few public members here. I was wondering if any of them had any advice for us or comment on that issue. Pretty big deal, and Al has signed up for something. Yep, Al. Yeah, yeah. sure, please. <laughs> First of all, I realize that uh, you know, some people think amenity fees should be included in your assessment. We'd have to have a pretty big assessment to include all the amenity fees. Another place we looked at, well, first of all, Al Selleck, 22 oh. Buckskin Lane. Uh, before we moved here, we looked at another place, and their brochure had a nice statement in it that said, your assessment covers the infrastructure of the amenities, and you will pay an additional amenity fee when you use the amenity. Uh, can we get amenity fees high enough to cover all the, all the spread between that? I doubt it. But a few things I would like you to consider when you're uh, talking about the different expenses, and especially the pool, which I live across the street from, I have a biased opinion. Uh, the fees, the proposals for hours and fees that was sent out for this year mentions that there's no uh, income in the evening and very few swimmers I think one reason there's no income in the evening is because the people that use the pool in the evening already have cards, so you're not going to be ringing in any more money. The, and if you close at 6 o'clock at night, the people that are working people aren't even going to buy a card because they can't get off work at 5 and get there by 6. Uh, personally, I think the hours should be 9 to 8 in the evening and you know, on Sunday through Thursday. Or pardon me, first of all, Sunday... Close at 6 because you have to treat the pools. So then, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, open till 8, and Friday and, or, yeah, Friday and Saturday, open till 9. Uh, I think you need to consider something for the long-term rentals. You know, we talked a lot about short-term rentals. A uh, person has a long-term rental. He's paid the assessments, and if the uh, person is renting their long-term, like a year lease, Shouldn't they then be able to either pay the three dollars a day when they come in, or buy the uh, hundred and fifty dollars? That's pass? the way it works, isn't it? No, they, they, can, they can come in on a daily basis. The long-term rental. We have, you know, the property owners that keep their right. name and everything. They come in and they test. Not buy a pass. They go through the daily fee. The, the, the resident. The rent. Yeah, but they pay the resident daily fee. No, they pay the guest fee. They're guests of the property owner. Okay. Well, that's my statement is I think they should be able to pay the owner's fee since the owner is not using the pool. Something to consider. Uh, I agree with that. I think they should. Whether we like it or not, we need to, we need to develop business here. More business, not less. We don't need to run people away. That's right. Oh, and one other question I had, and it's not on the fees at the minute, but if I could slip it in here. 
there's a lot of talk, a lot of time about you know, money and the engineers. Everything said we had to do pool number five, and then all of a sudden we don't have to do pool number five. Well, 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 well confused. Well, number five. Pardon me. <laughs> we don't have that many pools. Okay, we're going to do well number five. It's a big expense. Can be you know almost a million dollars to well number five, and then all of a sudden we don't have to do well number five. And I mean, is this back up our engineering firm and such? Just curious. Thank you. <coughs> Peggy Lodewijk's 19 Bob White Lane, and I totally agree with Al relating to um, the golf and the swimming and the long-term owners. And I also, uh, from a business standpoint, it really is important that the costs and profit or income be allocated by golf course, by pool, so that we know what to market and how it's going. So um, I would uh, agree with those recommendations. Um, I also, is it possible to put the agenda of the workshops on the website? I think you would have more people input, but even this morning I didn't see any kind of agenda for the workshop, so I really wasn't sure what you were all talking about. I apologize for that. And I do have an item, if it's on the agenda, it's regarding um, commercial water rates. I don't know if that's on the agenda. I was told it might be. I have done one for Berryville, Eureka, and Holiday Island. Communities Unlimited. They were doing the rate study. <coughs> process. Bruce, you, you spoke with him, didn't you? We should have it that young. Uh, it was delayed because our audit wasn't audit. here. Yeah. Audit, yeah. The yeah. Arkansas Water Board. Yeah, I, I spoke with the director of that organization a few days ago. And he wasn't certain of the status. He told me that it had been reassigned to another analyst, and uh, he said there was a, there was some problems that had held it up. Uh, one was the audit, which I told him I understood they already had that now, but there's another uh, issue of uh, separating. Well, we have the water sewer department that lumps things together. So all the labor is water sewer. They probably need to know well, how much of that is water, how much of it is sewer. I don't know that anybody knows. So we're going to have to somehow try to Separate untangle that, that to, yeah. to get their study done. But I haven't heard back since I talked with them a few days ago. I don't mean to add something. As I said, I thought it was on the agenda because Dave Durbin you know, wants to bring in a laundry, and I have a guy that wants to bring in a uh, state-of-the-art car wash. We have oh. businesses. Oh, I didn't understand what that was about. So you're talking about we establishing commercial water rates. For, yes, ma'am. Okay. So that we can bring in new businesses to bring in more income and, you know, employee possibility. And these, these both have the funds and the knowledge. Uh, but as I said, I was on the impression it was on the agenda, but I didn't have the agenda. So do I do that in a different time? Or do I make a request now? Car well, this, this is a car wash. Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you. I understand Dave Durbin has a loan and the money and wants to put in the laundry. Now, when I became president of the Chamber of Commerce, there were three particular businesses that were requested. One was a bakery, which is in. One was a laundry, and one was a car wash. We have an investor that will invest $300,000 in a car wash that recycles the water um, so there will be less water in our sewers and take the soap, okay, and it's organic. Okay, and that's a $300,000 investment. For example, but Berryville commercial water race for 2000 is 1420 Ours at 1500 is 1910. Okay, Berryville 18,000. The second price is 465. Our price for 28,000 is 770. We're 
6% commercial uh, rate above Berryville and 6% above Eureka. It's really hard when they use that type of <coughs> volume of, of uh, water to be uh, acceptable as a profit for their, pro their companies. Yes, but sir? without having a commercial rate, you're comparing commercial rates to our residential rates. We, that's why I'm requesting to have commercial rates, please, here. Because well, we don't have any. I agree with that, but I don't think it's fair to compare their commercial rate with our residential rate because we don't have a commercial rate. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. How does our residential rate compare to their residential rate? <clears throat> These are listed on their website as their rates. Okay? They're, they're uh, in-city rates and out-of-city rates. These are in-city rates. They don't really list commercial rates. They just list rates. So... I'm saying our current rates, whether it be residential, is compared to their residential. Our rates are still higher, so our commercial people can't make any money because they would be having the residential rates. Uh, several months ago, maybe even a year ago, uh, Phyllis, you may remember, <laughs> you've got a good memory, we raised the uh, water rates for everybody, $5. I saw and we that. Said, we think we're going to need it. All of us on the board had to go through eight hours of water training, uh, either down in Springdale or yeah. on a computer. We did that. Um, but uh, we, we raised the rates at that time because we thought we were lower than we should be. Mm -hmm. But we don't know until this water rate study is done by the Arkansas Water Board. So because of the what we just mentioned, the uh, audit not being done till really late, and now they have the audit, um, and as Bruce said, uh, they're we're in the queue. We're in the yeah. queue to have that done. So I would say that before we go, and I'm agreeing with you that we need to look at a commercial rate, but I think we need to look at all of our water rates, uh, residential, right. and uh, see where we are on that. Yeah, cause because this, if we, this was Berryville, Eureka, and your current yeah. regulations. Yeah. And those are the yeah. numbers that I was using. Cause let let me just field. mention that I talked with Dave Durbin and uh, provided them some information on historical usage at that laundromat, and it looks like he's prepared to go ahead with that. But let me say there's not inherently any difference between a residential rate and a commercial rate. It is, <laughs> uh, well, actually we do have, if they have high organics, we put in even higher. So if it was, a, say, a dairy that was discharging something with a lot of biological content, we would, we would have a surcharge on it, basically. But I think what this water rate, when we get it done, it will have, you know, so much as the customer charge, so much for this quantity, and so much for the larger quantity. And that may be more favorable to commercial businesses that use large quantities, <coughs> or residentials that use large quantities. It would be cost-based. So the, the cost isn't inherently any different for serving a residential than it is for serving a commercial. It's quantities that really, uh, so if we end up with a rate with a low, that's what we did. A low, low per gallon on the yeah. high end, that will that'll probably help the large volume user. Well, but we'll have to wait and see what the study turns out. Well, so we're just talking about a volume discount. Yes. yes. For yeah. a commercial right. customer. And that's what we had in the town I, I uh, ran, is we had, uh, you had a, no commercial rate, we didn't have any. We had, okay, if you use 5,000 gallons a month, uh, it was this price. If you use 10,000 gallons a month, it was this price. If you used 20,000, 30,000, like the grocery store, for instance, uh, in town where everything was cooled with water, uh, they might use uh, 150,000 gallons. Well, that was, a, that was a basically a much higher and much cheaper rate for those people because We'd have put them out of business if we'd have charged the same rate. Yeah. Well, we have that now, but it's going to change, likely. And, and the, um, the guy I talked to said, once they have the data, it's only a few weeks to finish it. Well, thank you for letting me know that you're working on something like this so we can bring in some more businesses. I, yeah, I do agree, though, that <coughs> HISA does have a responsibility to put the agenda out to, to the general public. There's no reason why that... It doesn't cost us anything to send out an email to the normal mailers that are signed up for to, to get an agenda. I think it would be appreciated because then you would get some more feedback, good or bad, but you get some feedback and people would appreciate it. 
Let me say ordinarily that's the case. Oh, okay. Uh, Carrie's on vacation this week. Right. And uh, we didn't get anybody cross-trained to do the website. So ordinarily, I think all the agendas are on the... Uh, We could just as well, though. But we could. Okay. Well, thank you for considering that, too. Appreciate it. Another item that I think that we need to take a uh, look at is an internal audit. I think uh, the operations of the Suburban Improvement District need an internal audit. I uh, know we got a financial uh, audit, but uh, we need an internal audit. What, what, uh, of what's going on? Uh, Larry, I don't know what that means. So, what do they look at on an internal audit? Well, they, they look at efficiencies. Uh, uh, or is this water department running efficiently? Is it how much of, of it is water sewer, or also in house? Uh, the office. Staff, are they being cross-trained? Internal audit, it, it, it would be a great advantage for this board. Who, who does those? Uh, there is a regular, uh, I would have to contact an audit firm and find out who, who does internal audits. Uh, there's more than likely one in Harrison or, or maybe even here in Eureka Spring. And what do they typically charge? I don't know. Oh. <clears throat> That's that. Before I start looking for one or do check anything out, I, I think board needs to, uh, to have knowledge of it. Well, I think this board's pretty gun shy when it comes to money, so it's going to come down to the cost. <laughs> yeah. uh, I also think that once we get uh, once Rich comes on board, uh, that would be a good charge for him. We would expect him as the district manager to look real hard at what's going on. Maybe not a formal study, but I would expect that that's going to be part of his uh, ongoing job responsibilities is to keep an eye on things just such as that. Well, I will investigate it and report back. Okay. Well, I think we've, we've discussed amenity fees. We hadn't crossed that off of discussion topics, but I think it's been discussed. Uh, I, saw, I saw the one that you put out for 185 for three people or whatever for a family pass. I, I think it should be a family pass should, or individual pass or family pass should be the same. Uh, and it doesn't make any difference if they got five kids. We're not going to penalize them. If they got one kid, we're, no. we're not going to do that. Uh, I don't think that, I think a family pass should be a family pass. A family pass. And also, I also think that if that family, pa if they have a family pla pass and they have grandkids come in, mm -hmm. those grandkids, are, they're not charged for those kids. They're, they're not charged for the guests that they bring. I, wow. Okay. I think we need to charge the big one who mm -hmm. uses the pool. The biggest um, complaint last year for a couple of families is when they're, now we're talking extended family members, not dependent children, okay? When you have a, a family pass, that's why it's called a household pass. A lot of younger families are moving in here, so you have families coming in. I know last year we had families with two young boys. We sell the family passes because even also if you have a grandchild who is your dependent, okay, for some reason down the family, then that child is included also in the household pass. But the families that had a problem with, you know, extending a family pass, you have grown children, children, grandchildren, their spouses, their great-grandchildren, nieces and nephews weren't covered, but the families that came in had 12 people with them. And these were all extended family members, but they're all adults, they're not your dependents anymore. So they had to write a check standing there for $75 or $50 every time they came in, and that's not fair. That's, I knew that wasn't going to fly with these families that have big, big families uh, that come to visit one or two weeks out of the year. Um, so what I did was say it's a ex uh, property-owned extended pass is what I renamed it. In other words, you have a, you, you, 
couple own this house, husband and wife, okay? They don't have to buy a pass. They go down here to the extended property owner pass, and they say, well, we have six extended members that could come at any time, and so they're going to pay 205 plus tax for that pass. It will also include your family's not coming, but hey, I've got friends coming from Illinois. There's four of them coming. Oh, they'll get in under this pass. You won't pay for them as a, as a guest coming in because you've already secured up to six people can come in with you under that pass. It's this, not complicated. I know. It's you, way too complicated. When I look at this sheet and I compare it to the old price sheet, yeah. this is so confusing. And I, right away, you, you say a household pass, dependent family member with in the Within home, the 200 home. bucks. Right. Well, I could do the same thing, go down and buy the same pass for 185 bucks. With, uh, and you have three extended members that can come in with you. Three others beside you and your wife. That, and that says plus. No, it's, it's that's way too complicated. individual or couple pass. Either way. Plus. Yeah. Plus. Plus yeah. the three members. Plus. So we, you we and need to keep The same thing. These, these uh, swimming passes could actually go to a punch card. And for the short-term rentals, it's a red punch card. For the homeowners, it's a green punch card. They don't have to change money. They can just buy a punch card and they send their grandkids, whoever, I don't care. If they're on the punch card, they're covered. Well, if Janice, I, I agree. If Janice's system is in place, this system they, you don't carry in a punch card. They say, I'm on right. Randy Rolfe's uh, we pull up your name. family. They find your name and say, okay, fine, it's go right on there. Well, how I mean, about she, if they just walk in and show me that I punched their green card? Well, then you still have to look them up at the computer. Yeah, Why? You still they don't have, have to look them up. they got a green card. Well, that green card could come from anywhere. I mean, no, I, no, it's it, issued by holiday. It's no different well, than any other punch card. It, That's right. The advantage of, of not having the punch card is handling. It's, it, it's handling. And, and, and as long as there's a system in place to look on your system, your computer system. The computer system done. has it. it. It takes too much time and it's too complicated. It's way too complicated. And, and all it does is cause unrest and grief. Well, uh, well it's, you know, you know, everybody has, has a determination of it. this is what it really means and this is what I'm saying here. And No, you don't have it. But you don't understand it's not that way. We, and all you do is end up making I, people mad and angry and... and no. Well, the problem that we had... Keep it simple. We had people in here last year uh, when we went to the $5 fee. We had numerous complaints mm -hmm. about, well, my five grandkids came and I had to fork out $25 every single That's day. Right. Yep. And this would eliminate... Right. That portion, you're never going to make everybody happy anyway. That, that's right. But if that they, would if they're house guests, they should come in free with you. Well, wow. You're using the water, you're using the chemicals. <laughs> we're, we're, using the we're sitting facility. here saying, you know, to make I money. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's very, okay, let me give you an example. All right, in a busy morning when we're having water aerobics. You're talking about a punch card, Randy. All the golfers are going to come in. All these women are walking in for water aerobics. Okay, there's a sign-in sheet. If you have paid a pass, just write your name, go out. Get out of the way. People have to pay. They're standing in the line, all these women. The golfers come in. You got a punch pass, you're going to be in that line too before you can go out there and punch because we have to punch that pass. You write your name down. We, after everybody's cleared out, we go to that list. Okay, here's the name. Okay, yeah, yeah. We put you in because you're not standing there with a punch card. Punch cards would tie up a whole line. If you're in the computer... You give us your name, you're fine. I, I don't understand. You know, I said that this was talked to last year. It's so complicated. You don't come down there. You don't see what we see, and it's not complicated. It would be in the system. Your name is there. What you've got extended up to six, your good is golden. I, I, I can't explain how you think it's complicated. You're not, you're not trusting in what I have done down there for 18 years. And you just think it's all complicated, but that's okay. You do what you want, and then I'll send out a, a you know a, a slip who wants to volunteer from six to nine o'clock at night too. <laughs> well, I think there is, uh, oh, I don't know, some advantage to having something like what Janice is talking about. When you have guests and you're the host 
you know, it's a lot nicer to go down there and say, you know, we're covered, rather than having to write out a check every darn time. Yeah, right. It yeah, feels, I, I feels awkward to write yeah. out a check. Right. Yeah, and it's not as painful. <laughs> it's already got money gone. <laughs> well, plus, it, it, if your company comes more frequently than you had expected, some, something comes up, they're, they're four that, times that with that will cover. That would include it throughout the whole summer. Yeah. And It makes sense to me. How many people come in with 10 people, 10 guests, grandkids, or whatever? How many people do that? There are several families that do that. The Lures are one. Uh, uh, McLaughlin is another. Um, there's other ones that have that stopped in New York. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but couldn't they walk the length of the pool till they get up to their neck and then turn around and walk back? You know, just walk short laps. But I mean, there's all of a sudden there's this you know eight to nine group of three. I don't know. That's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> they can they okay the schedule for the pool is the lap swimmers come eight to nine we are not there we show up about 20 minutes to nine to open up for everything else they come in through the back gate where kim has got it open because she's cleaning the pool and stuff the lap swimmers um kind of they keep edging a little bit more and more so they'll show up before eight they want to get in the pool they're trying <laughs> to vacuum the pool it, it it gets a little bit hairy out there and then when they're still swimming laps after 9 o'clock, because nobody's coming in to swim, I go out there and they get mad at me. And they yell at me that they're still swimming and there's nobody in the pool. Because I'll say, somebody's showing up, you need to get out now. Well, I know it. Never mind. Okay, we're going to go another, another, another story. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is water aerobics from 9.30 to 10.30 in the pool. Ladies come in. We've had groups up to 35, 40 people in that small area of the pool. Um, after that, there is no other, there's no set thing to do, for, it's open, but we usually don't start to see people until closer to after one o'clock, and then they start coming in. But it's pretty empty by that time, but we have golfers then that start coming into golf, but there you have it. Larry will, will uh, As we need to uh, transfer the management of, of the easements and right-of-ways to the city, I think, they're able to apply for some grants at that point. Just to, you know, the just transfer, say, a lease to this they can then get uh, some uh, the electrical companies, the uh, telephone companies. The uh, they can they can generate some revenue, and they are going to they're eligible for more money for federal and state money. And and we can't get it right now at all. So if we streamline those operations and and potentially improve those utility services through uh, centralization management. Uh, I think we can get and negotiate a, uh, a responsible uh, program with the city to help generate some funds uh, for our amenities. And they can, they can then maybe, uh, if they can generate enough money, they, they may be able to take over the fire department. You know, right now, there's not, a, by law, Holiday Island does not have to have a fire department. If, in fact, we say we had a lawsuit, and they said, hey, you, you don't have to have a fire department. And say a, then maybe a judge said, okay, you guys are going to have to cut the fire department. You'd close the door. The city would therefore, by law, has to take it over. But if they wouldn't have any money to take it over at that point. So this way, I think if we think about those easements on the road right of the city would there could generate some money through that, quite a little money, in fact, I think throughout. I think that's something we ought to put on the agenda for next for next meeting, because I I think it's pretty important to the city. I think they're kind of working on that project right now. Do you have anything to say about that as far as your chat with the uh, uh, Tim Hutchison, the lawyer? Uh, I'm a little <coughs> uh, I'm a little worried about uh, Cherokee Village and other things that have to do with roads. Uh, Doug, you weren't here when that case went down over there, but um, no, I wasn't. We, we, we uh, there's there's a lot to uh, say about that, Bruce. Maybe. Well, I haven't had any any discussion with Tim Hutchinson about the roads or road wideways at all. I think it'd be premature on our, our next meeting to make any uh, decisions on that. I think you need to work out some agreements. At an administrative level between HISID and the city as to what, what you want to do. That's what I'm saying is the new manager that comes in needs to get talked with the city because I, I think they're kind of working on that thing. 
I think they have a committee that's kind of working on that right now. So I think uh, if our new manager comes in, he could work with the city and see what the possibilities are for that. Because I think it could generate some money for Holiday Island. And that would benefit us all. That would take off some of the responsibility for, for uh, Holiday Island, our district. So that we could, but I think that's something we, I'm not saying we make a decision this next meeting. I'm saying it's, you know, we just up for discussion and maybe have our new D DM uh, go talk with the city at that, at that point. I think that's, that's what I'm talking about, not just making a decision we don't know anything about. Yeah. Secondly, I don't know, can you even get the attorney to ever respond back to you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I got, got on the phone with him this past week, and it turned out he was very good to work with, and I, uh, I'm very satisfied. I might add, uh, some time ago, uh, Mayor Keyes and I were chatting and, and going, to, he, he's made the suggestion that we form an ad hoc committee uh, to work on intertwining how we could get the, the suburban improvement district in the city to, to focus on some points of, of merger, merging it together. And, and uh, I, I told him I would, be happy to work with him on that, and uh, I think it, it's kind of in the mill. I think you have an immediate need to work out something because the city has a pile of money that could be allocated to uh, road improvements, but they don't, you know, you got to work out some arrangement, so. Yeah. Uh, Ken had asked about <clears throat> paving in his brief email to us, and uh, there was nothing in the budget for the roads department for paving because we anticipated the city being able to do some funding of that. So what we need to do is sit down with the city right now, knowing that they have funds available, and, and work out regulatory-wise <clears throat> is the big gotcha is, is what the what we can do under the, the SID laws. And uh, the, the money's there and we're aware of it and that's why we didn't put it in the budget. So we just need to get it coordinated and get started with it. Well, when uh, Mr. Presley was here, uh, he had a meeting with, uh, I think it was Dan Keyes and their attorney for the city and our attorney Hutchison and they had that meeting in Springdale. I believe it was uh, about lots at that time. Uh, I think we need to do the same thing in terms of uh, road and right of way uh, because of the money that uh, Bruce mentioned. The city has money and they're doing a great job of collecting that money as they were promised when they formed the city, but now they can't, they're looking at ways to spend it legally, okay? So uh, I think that would be a good idea and Larry, I like your idea of this ad hoc committee, maybe a couple of board members from each and uh, the, two ma the mayor and the district manager to get together and work out some of these things. Uh, Phyllis, I agree with you on a paving. We haven't done any chip or sealing, uh, chip and sealing or paving for, what, two years now? Maybe, maybe even more. But there was uh, five streets that were, I, I don't know if Mr. Presley promised it, but it came up in his meetings, uh, and they were up off of Table Rock Drive. And one of the questions was, there's a lot of leaks under that one street, and, uh, but it, it looked like they were gonna get those done even though there's a lot of leaks and pipes underneath. So why would you put a lot of money on top if we're gonna to continue to have leaks? But at some point in time, we have 69 miles of road. We can't just go 10 years and never put anything on them, right? We cannot do that. And that's what happened with the, some of the infrastructure, like the rec center and so forth. We've gotta put money into maintaining things. So I would like to see that happen, what your idea was. Okay. I think, Dan, you've been uh, rallying up some of those roads over there. The ones that are... Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Anything else? Uh, I had one announcement, and I wanted to make sure I was correct on this. Al, you're always up to date on this. I think there's a road cleanup Friday. Ben Helmer's in charge of it, and uh, we need a lot of people out for road cleanup, and I think it's Friday the 12th, and I should have called... So, Good. 
so people who are listening on the broadcast, come on out, pick up trash, make this place look great. Thank you. Uh, on, on our planning commission for the city and we're in the process of trying to identify the short-term rentals on Holiday Island and it's turning out to be a lot more significant than anybody here reckon has any idea what it is I think how many conditional use permits have you already all put out about 50 65 and Lynn thinks there's he did some kind of analysis and he thinks there's over 150 160 um, so you've got a new uh, no well you you you've got something you, your demographics of, of holiday island are changing Nobody realizes how many, uh, and this is a this is an industry, and uh, we're we're now trying to get a hold on that. We're trying to you know get some regulation on it, but you're talking about, and these people are all advertising Holiday Island. You know, come stay here, golfing, swimming. So I mean, you better you know you need to deal with it. You can't make it uh, prohibitive. <laughs> or, uh, we're going to put. I don't. You know. I'm kind of scared of it. I mean. I mean. We, you look around your 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 neighborhood, and you've got part-time people, and you got short-term rentals all over the place anymore. So we're. You know. Are we losing our permanent residents? Uh, so. And we're, we're, are we going to be a you know, a vacation destination, and if that's, if that's, you know, we need to make sure that we're not driving them off because right. you may end up with a whole bunch of um, real estate that won't sell. And, and right now they're propping up your residence. Anyway, um, the other thing on the, you know, we've tried to get something going on this road thing, and we, we've hit a roadblock because of the, the um, lawsuits that the district's got, you know, where they're uh, questioning the AOB because of the uh, road uh, mileage that the city has already taken over. Because, but I think I think we can work through it because, you know, on the grants that we, you know that we got that one year, uh, I think it right says it has to be city owned. Or, but the turn back money, I read the statue, and it, I, th I think we I think we can spend that money on on the community roads. And, you know, and it, this goes back to who nobody's ever been able to determine who the hell the roads belong to. Whether it's, you know, whether dedicated to the public on all the plat maps. Yeah. Uh, so I and I think by virtue of that, Larry, I think the turn back money that's sitting in the bank could be used on that. But right now, uh, I think and Dan is you know I've talked to him several times about it. Um, is is afraid to move on it because of of the um, AOBs, AOB and lawsuits that are in process and until those lawsuits come to some kind of conclusion, I think we're kind of stuck. One more question of uh, maybe Janice and Bruce. Uh, has the plumbing been fixed that the destruction company ruined in the little pool? And then the second question is, when will a, a new uh, building open? What what date will are you looking at for opening that thing? Okay, the last time I talked to Eric, last week um, supposedly this week he's going to call for an inspection I don't know who he's going to call to come and inspect it with him you know to approve it um, then he told me after that okay we still don't have a certificate of occupancy at that point even if we accept the building because the pump 
room has to be complete and the pool has to be functioning, the small pool. Then we get a certificate of occupancy. And he said that because that was part of the construction area. The big pool can still open. They didn't do anything with that, but it's on this side. Now, he said, I can't, you know, we cannot call in another electrician until they're signed off on his stuff, on the C.J. Johnson stuff. Then we can call in um, Wes, who did, you know, the, the, all the uh, electric there, to put the electric back in that small room. We have no electric in there. That was not part of the deal because of how badly it was destroyed. So he has to come in, put the electric in. Then Richard, the pool guy that is here in Eureka that helps Kim, he's going to put the pipes back together. He thinks he can do that. And then we have to start it up and see if everything's OK. Do you have so, any idea what the cost of this was that the destruction company caused? That, uh, you know, I have no idea yet. I don't know what Wes is going to charge us. I don't know what uh, Richard's going to charge for repairing all those pipes. And we have to keep our fingers crossed that nothing under the ground has been destroyed. So when is, this, when is the CO going to be issued that David Dombro does that? Uh, he, I guess he'll be there for the walkthrough. You know, walkthrough. And I, I would assume somebody from here is going to be there for the walkthrough. And I guess Eric will let you know when all that's going to be. And um, then we have to go with the other stuff. At what, that are point. you looking two, three weeks, three weeks, a month, what? I don't know. I, it's, you know, what the pipes and the electric come in, what's the schedule. We have to just get them on the schedule, you know, to do it. I'm hoping, I mean, we'll still be able to open, at Memorial Day, we'll open the big pool. That will open up okay. We just can't use that building yet until all that stuff is done. And then move, I mean, we still have to move over there, get our IT guy in there to get us all hooked up and, you know, running for customers. So. Thank you. Don't know. Okay. Uh, if any, anybody got anything else? Okay. Well, let's just let all in favor say aye. 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 Let's do it.